From one islander to another, Isle of Wight Radio proudly presents John Hannam Meets. Hi, and welcome to another John Hannam Meets. Today, it's a Hannam archive, and we go back to 1980, when I had the great thrill of interviewing Frankie Howard, one of my all-time comedy heroes, backstage at Sandown Pavilion. So it's back to 1980 when I wrote an article for the local paper, the Isle of Wight Weekly Post. I took along my faithful cassette recorder to record the interview. So let's go back to those days when I just held a small tape recorder in front of Frankie Howard and we talked for nearly half an hour. <laughs> Another Hannam Archive. Delighted to say my guest tonight is a man I've waited to meet for many, many years. That's Frankie Howard. Frankie, welcome to the Archive. I love the way you say many, many years. You make it sound like hundreds of years. We're only youngsters, you know. (laughs) Frankie, before we go into your early days, I didn't realise you'd appeared on the island before, but you have, haven't you? Yeah, I did uh, a couple of Sunday concerts here, but this was in the 50s. And I remember, I I think I went from Ride to Sand. I went to Shanklin. And uh, I, I remember I was the following day. I had to get back to do something else, and I so I had to go back by motorboat because the ferries weren't r- running so late at night. I remember that very well. Yeah, with my pianist, my lady pianist of those days. Yeah, I remember the sand. I was at the pier. Was I remember the, it was a lovely. It's actually it was very much like tonight, lovely sunny night, summer's evening, and I remember looking down at the sands, and the the sea was calm. It was you know it was really beautiful, and. Uh, it's a bit different. I mean, it's a, it's beautiful tonight, but you know what the weather's been like, and uh, it's a godsend to see all this lovely sun in summer. I tell you, my, I, one thing about um, uh, from the point of view of holidays, my brother is a great fan of the Isle of Wight. He used to come over here year after year with his wife, so he's a so one Howard came over here regularly. <laughs> Let's go back to those early days. In your very early days, it was an awful struggle for you, sort of failed at RADA and you failed to get into ENT, so were you ever sort of really put off that you'd ever make the profession? Uh, no, I don't really think I was in an odd way because I think I was so <laughs> delusional, I thought, oh no, it was bound to happen eventually. I, I, no, I tell you why, you know, it's a strange, you may find this a bit odd, but uh, when I was quite young, I, did, I took a part, I was only a teenager, in a play for the church. It was a church dramatic society and the play was called Tilly of Bloomsbury. And I was only 13 and I used to have an impediment of speech when I got very nervous and I was, but I'd, I just wanted to be in this dramatic society to do anything because I was very stage struck and just to be a stage manager. Anyway, the producer of this play, who was a lady, was a very nice woman, she was a very kind woman, she gave me a part. Now, I was being so young, I was very tall, mind you, but being 13, I, was, I wasn't young enough to play a sort of 25 year old, because they couldn't make me up to look 25, but they could put a beard on me to make me look older, a lot older, you understand, put a grey beard and grey the hair, so I, they played the part of Tilly's father, Tilly's father, and I did this part and I worked hard at it, and twice a week I used to go around to this lady's house, and she coached me, word for word, like a parrot, week after week learned to talk after her and uh, when I did the play at the local hall it was a big success the play was a success and I got a very good press the, when the critics came in and I was all but naturally I was thrilled I was grateful to be noticed at all and this uh, woman and then I went to church because I was a Sunday school teacher incidentally it may, may, may come as a shock to you but I was and uh, this church warden said to me, you should be an actor. That's what you should do, be an actor. And I thought, that's right, I will. I will that's what I'm going to be, I'll be an actor. Something I can do, something I think I've got some talent for. And I fought away and plugged away, I went to evening classes and I did funny concert parties and plays and you name it, I did, I did church uh, pageants. I even was in one of Robin Hood's men in, a, in, a, in an army tattoo. I did everything you could think of. And um, I went in for a scholarship at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, RADA, and they threw me out because I was stuttered a bit and doing Shakespeare doesn't really go together. 
And so they said, no, it's not for you. And I was broken hearted about this. I was I was a teenager. I was just leaving school and I thought, oh, so I went back home and I went to some fields where I lived, near where I lived. It was a gray, cloudy day. And I sat there and I cried for about an hour. I sobbed my heart out because I was so disappointed. And I suddenly thought to myself, now this, now this is no good. Now you, you ah, now you must have a bit of courage, because obviously you're not meant to be a straight actor. You're never going to be a Laurence Olivier, but you could be a funny man. You could be a comic because you're good in comedy parts on these when you do these plays and comedy concert parties. Be a comic. So I thought, right, that's what I'm going to do. And really, I went on from there. I, I had this sort of idea that I suppose it was a sort of religious thing in a kind of way. I felt that I was. I felt that I'd been given a bit of talent, and not I'm not a you know not an exceptional amount, but I thought I had some talent, and I thought well one day I'll have the opportunity to use it. I, otherwise, I wouldn't have been given it. So I'm going to have the opportunity to use it uh, because, uh, as I say, um, otherwise I wouldn't have been given it. So I worked on that uh, that sort of idea, and I did get it a chance eventually. Started off as bottom of the bill, you see, after the war in this review around the music halls and the other bottom of the bill was Max Bygraves and we shared the same dressing room the same digs and the same salary which wasn't much I might add <laughs> and uh, then after about six to ten weeks they were looking for people t to take part in the show on the radio Variety Bandbox and so they wanted people to audition and I, my office the agent put me in for an audition so I had this audition and in October and I started on Variety Bandbox, at the bottom of the bill on the radio, December the 1st. I think I got three pounds for it. Of course, that was listened to by practically everyone in the country in those days, wasn't it? Well, they, <laughs> they had to. <laughs> they had to listen to that. I'll tell you why. I used to go out on a Sunday, I think, at 8 o'clock to 9. There was no television. There was only radio. And I think there were two channels on the radio. And the other channel used to put out symphony concerts. So you can imagine, everybody turned to, what, to listen to the variety. And uh, everybody switched on. It was a oh yes, it had an enormous following. A lot of people came on the show because I was a regular. I was a sort of uh, the regular. Well, there were two of regulars, myself and Derek Roy, and we ch he did one week and I did the other. And this went on week after week, week after week. And we used to make jokes about each other. But we, at the same time, uh, we were resident. But they introduced a lot of new people on this particular variety show where people came in and did little you know just did, did spots on it Harry Seacombe was on it I remember Bum Monkhouse the young who's 21 I think at the time Spike Milligan a lot of people like that or oh, a lot of comedians who perhaps came out of the army or just up and coming got a did this program and I remember them all very well Tony Hancock was on oh yeah long that's right the whole list of them of course, in your vivid uh, autobiography, which I think is rather super, you, you describe when you sort of had those lean years. Is this something now which you're glad you had? Does it make you... Wait, 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 which lean years well, you mean? You sort of after the 50s? After? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I had uh, some lean years. I had a, 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 a down period from about 59 to 62. 62, 63. Yeah, 62 would be because I remember this went on until my mother died. My mother died uh, and... I was actually very upset, and at the time I thought, well, what am I what, worried about show business for? Because people are more important than fame and fortune and things like that. And uh, but strangely enough, almost the following day, two days, I got a phone call to, to appear on television, which I hadn't had for a long time. And so um, things altered after that very quickly. It was very odd, and. Um, I almost sort of didn't bother him more, and all of a sudden things happen. And it often that's often the way of life, you know, that you give up and you think, oh, well, not give up exactly, but you think, oh well, it doesn't really matter too much, and often things go much better. But while you're striving and and straining, things sometimes go worse, you know. Of course, by about sixty-seven, you were right back. At the top. Well, I got, I was very lucky, really, because uh, when I was in pantomime, I remember it was a freezing cold Christmas, was smog everywhere. But I was playing in pantomime in Coventry, you know, Puss in Boots. And would you believe I was playing the king? I used to play Simple Simon and Idle Jack and all the down. But now suddenly I was a king, anyway. With Puss in Boots and uh, a comedy king I was, and a very uh, clumsy king. But anyway, uh, with a nagging wife, I remember that in it. This is 63. And 
a Broadway play was coming over to London, a Broadway musical called A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. And they want, and then somebody suggested to the New York producers and writers that I might be suitable. I think it was Sir John Gilgood was talking and he said, oh, we've got, a, we've got a chap called Frankie Howard I think might be suitable for this in London. And they came down to see me. The two writers came to see me at the Coventry Pantomime. Uh, Puss in Boots. And I was petrified. I remember this. I can remember vividly them coming because, you know, Americans have never seen pantomime. <laughs> and, it, I mean, you know, and it comes as a complete shock to make head or tail of it. I mean, you have boys dressed as girls and dames and women. And, they, and this is something quite unusual. They're not used to it at all. And um, I thought, I wonder what they'll make of it. Uh, but they came back afterwards. They'd been eating, eating peanuts and joining in and shouting out with the children and and eating ice cream. They, they enjoyed it. And I got the part. So that really was a, a comeback. And I got that in... And I that show opened in September or October. I can't think. September 1963. And that's really what... Uh, propelled me back because it was the West End of London and a lot of publicity and all the critics you know uh, joined in and gave me a good press and um, it started um, you know as they say the old saying success breeds success and they it started up again of course people like Tony Hancock when they were at the height of their fame people used to stop in and not go out and you had similar oh, yeah. without Pompeii which was a series which was fantastically successful wasn't it really? yes it was successful but um, we did I only did funny enough I only did two series you know I only did 14 shows, 14 up and bass, but they repeated them the following year, and that was 10 years ago. So it's a long time ago, really. Yes, uh, but you see, television, is, as you know, is very important these days. Everybody gets glued to telly. I mean, I like watching the telly. And uh, you do you find that I think that a lot of youngsters tend to go out more. I mean, the cinemas, it seems to me, the young people go out to discotheques and they go out to the cinemas. But I think older people stop in and see Crossroads and yeah. the Coronation Street, etc., etc., etc. If you had another chance of a series like that, would you sort of go in? in well, I don't know. I, 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 you see, what happened was I did have another chance in a way. I mean, it was I stopped it actually. I mean, we could have gone on and done some more, but uh, I there was a, we had some problems with writers because the one who wrote it became not very well, unfortunately. The man who was writing it and he was very clever, and you know you can't. It's easy to say, but you can't. Get, if you're doing something and somebody writes it, uh, they have a style. Comedians have styles of their own, usually. Um, singers do, uh, actors do. But sometimes uh, a lot of actors have a style of their own. You know, you know, you know exactly what you're going to get. Right. I mean, a great example was John Wayne, of course, film stars. You know, he was he was going to do his, his thing as John Wayne. But um, writers are the same. They have their styles. And I mean, Johnny Spate wrote to, uh, who was an old friend of mine, who I discovered, as a matter of fact, Johnny Spate was an insurance clerk. But he wrote eventually, became enormous success with To Death to His Part, as you know. Mm. Well, I mean, that was a tremendous success. And then Gorton Simpson, who also used to write for me for the radio in the early 50s, they wrote Steptoe and Son. That was an enormous success. Well. You couldn't give other people and say, well, let them write Steptoe and Son and let them write Till Death to Us Part because it didn't work. It's like saying, asking somebody else to write Shakespeare. It doesn't work, you know. There's only one Shakespeare. And then, uh, there was only one um, Johnny Spate for, for that. There was only one Gorton Simpson to write Steptoe. And, and really, the writer who wrote to Pompey really was a bit like that. It was very, very difficult to find somebody else to do exactly the way he did it. Mind you, if somebody came along with a series of writers, and you have to, see, writers are the important thing. If some writers came along and said, now look, here's a good idea, uh, and then we'll, let's sort something out, we'll try something, I would, do, you know, I do it with the greatest of pleasures. As a matter of fact, I might do something later on in the year, we're discussing several f things. But it is, if, what underneath it all is the writers. If you've got no writers, you've got no show. I mean, it's no good playing the piano if you've got nothing to play, is it? You can have some tunes. Someone has to compose the music, unless you do it yourself. But if you do it yourself, it's marvellous. But you see, I'm not a, a, a script writer. I, don't, I can help, and I can give ideas, perhaps, sometimes, some good, some bad, and I can uh, compile things. But I, I'm not a writer. I tell you who writes for himself, and it's marvellous. Who used to write for me? Funny enough, he seems to have written for me at some time. It was Eric Sykes. Now, Eric Sykes writes his own stuff. Spike Millington does. A lot of artists don't. A lot of artists don't. Comedians don't write their own material. It's written for them, or they get it together from various sources. 
You're still a great worrier, frankly. I mean, you've often worry? said you, in your books that you, you worry a bit. Do you worry a great deal or not? Really? Well, I think this is one of those things that, uh, you know, people interview me, and it, it's nice to have something for them to talk about. So this subject crops up. You say, what you're doing now, you see. <laughs> so if I say no... You don't look very worried to me. <laughs> no, I'm glad to hear you say so. No, no, I, I, it's... Uh, you know, the... the uh, Everybody who's conscientious, if I may say so, worries. I mean, if people are going to go have somebody in for a meal or, you know, mother's going to cook for for Christmas and people are coming to have Christmas dinner, she worries to get it right pr properly. And I think uh, everybody, everybody does that. And people do worry about their work. It's their living. Uh, people are going to... I mean, when I'm on television or any artist, millions of people have what possibly, I hope, watch... <laughs> And if they don't like it, they're, they're going to say, "I don't think much of that." And the critics come along, and because I mean, so it, it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a profession whereby you have to take trouble, take, you know, concern. And all um, when I was young, I used to work like mad at, uh, at rehearsing and doing it properly and trying to find out what to do, and what not to do. You know, people are very surprised sometimes that they come along to a television studio. And sometimes when I did up Pompeii, for instance, friends would come into the studio the actual day of doing the show. We'd rehearse it all week in a, would you believe, a church hall, which you might find inappropriate <laughs> for it, but never mind, we did it. So we had a lot of people rehearse in halls, in church halls. And then we actually did the show on the Sunday. So we'd get there in the morning at 10, and we would sort of go through with tapes on the floor to find positions and do it very slowly and keep doing it till the cameras got, the four cameras all got their positions, they marked the cameras and they shot one, shot two, and then they, the lighting man would be there and the scenery and there was a tremendous amount of hive and bustle and there'd be costumers getting things ready, the makeup girls. That would go on till about three in the afternoon, then have a break for some tea, then we'd do it again. And we'd do it now, we'd try and do it all, the whole thing in one go, you see, and things would go wrong. The producer would come down and make notes, and we have to know, we'd have to know, know every camera, which was on where, which camera, click, click, click. And then we'd do it again at about five, and by this time we'd do it with costumes. So all the costumes had to be done properly, so then we'd do it all again. And then, and naturally in the studio, you get all the tremendous amount of lights on you. Lights, I mean, there's hundreds of lights on you, it's very hot. And then, uh, then at eight o'clock or half past seven, I think it was, the show would be start. So the audience would come in at seven and they'd come by coaches. There'd be all sorts of people coming from all sorts of uh, places, trips. And then about quarter past seven, the producer would go on this, in front of the audience and explain what the show was about and, and, and told them about the camera angles and what went on. And then after that, I'd come on and I'd do talk to the audience and do some jokes for about ten minutes. And then during the, re the actual taping of the actual recording, we used to last about an hour, so an hour and a half. Uh, Sometimes we'd, we'd have to do retakes, and while they'd change angles and change scenery, I would go out and tell some jokes. So it was a very long night, you know, a long day. So the time you'd finish, and it was about 10 o'clock, you were in the studio for 12 hours under heavy lights. It was very tiring, and uh, apart that was the rehearsal, but it was very enjoyable, particularly if the show went well, and everything went smoothly, and it was very, you know, very enjoyable. But when I used to invite friends that used to come sometimes during the day and we used to sit in the, in the empty seats where the audience would sit in the evening, and I used to sit there and watch all these rehearsals, they used to say to me afterwards, you know, we, I had no idea so much went into a show. Mm. Because he said it was surprising when you see it on the screen. All you see is just a few people on a screen. But in actual in fact, in the studio, there are hundreds of technicians running around all day. Tremendous. I mean, I, have, you, have you seen the television live? Well, not live. You know, you've seen some shows taped, have yeah. you? Over in where? Over in Southern, I suppose, is it? Yeah. Mm. yeah. And uh, well, you know, the, with the work that goes on, particularly on uh, an, on an elaborate show, and when you're they're making films, for instance, well, you know what? That that's what that oh, that long trouble is. That is filming. <laughs> yeah. Frankie, let's go right away from show business. Yeah. How do you relax? What are your sort of hobbies, really? Uh, I like reading. I like swimming very much, but in hot water, warm water. I mean, yeah. not icy cold water. That's the Mediterranean. I like blue seas. I'm, I'm getting a bit past it now, but I used to like to play tennis. I used to be quite. I wasn't bad either. I used to be. I wasn't brilliant. I wasn't. I'm not known beyond Borg. He had nothing to worry about. But uh, I enjoyed it. I knocked. I was wasn't bad when I was very young, and I was a great enthusiast. And it's a tough game, you know, tennis. It's uh, 
it's even tougher than it looks. Um, then what else? Uh, I like music very much. I used to go to concerts. And I used to like the theatre. I used to like to go. I like the. I see. You say get, getting away from the theatrical profession, but I was. It. I. I like show business. I mean, I like to see other films and other artists and shows. I used to go to see the shows and other artists perform. I like watching the telly. Um, what else do I like? Uh, I like walking a lot. I like. I love walking. I. I can walk for hours, and I find it. Um, it's a great um, relaxing and leaves tension a lot walking. I, I like walking by the sea particularly. I walk for hours by the sea. As a matter of fact, I used to often rehearse when I'm walking alone out of the country with the script. And I, learn, I say rehearse, I've got, it's a question of learning words. That's you know, half the thing about show business. It's a funny thing, isn't the glamour of doing it? It's just learning the damn words. It's just like learning pages and pages of dialogue. And, uh, you know, Sometimes you when you have to sit up very late at night, just learning words, line after line after line, learning learn off like a parrot. That's the most difficult thing, learning the words. What do the Americans think of you on Sergeant Pepper's? Oh, we've got a good press over there, the, but but the, the movie it was a very strange movie. It could have been could have been very much better than it was. It had a, an interesting idea, but it um, we didn't it lacked it lacked a story. It wanted a story in it. It wanted more story, and I thought uh, you know it could have been so much better with bit more what is the word effort or care or I don't know but I mean when you see when you're in a film um, and you're being produced and directed by somebody you don't go, I mean you can't go around to, to, to people telling them what to do because it's a big industry you get a producer you get a director you get who tells you what to do you get all the cameramen you get the, the people who write the scripts you get scene shifters and and uh, and the people who do makeup and then light it all. It and it, there's no, hundreds of people are involved. Well, and then when the film's made, all the bits are put together. They ha they have what they call an editor. As you know, an editor, and he cuts out what he thinks and he puts bits together. And and you see, well, and over that, uh, no um, artist, no actor has any control over that. He has to do what he's told. And um, that's what is you. That's what it's. It's like a traffic warden. He directs the traffic, and uh, a film director directs the actors. So you can't do as you want, you have to do as you're told. Frank, before you leave us, how do you see the future career? How do you I got no idea. I never did really. <laughs> um, I never really d did. I always used to think, well, let's see what turns up. My temperament's always been a restless temperament. I've always had a restless temperament. I like to move around. I've always been a bit of a gypsy. I mean, but I was younger. Well, I've been and been more courageous. I'd, I'd like to be an explorer, I think. I like to find new places. I like to go, I like traveling, I like to see places and people and uh, and I'm very curious and and so therefore uh, whereas some artists like to have their whole future planned and mapped out I've always been inclined to say well let's see what comes along and not get too tied down so when I'm um, you say to me what are you going to do after the end of the year I have no idea at all I have no idea what I'm going to do and that's the, I have no idea whatsoever I mean several things have been suggested to me and I say well let's see what plays come in and all sorts of that. I think well let's see what turns up so it might excite it might happen I mean I'm, I'm the sort of I've always been a bit of a mad brain I'll tell you this <laughs> I mean really I go to most silly things because I'm uh, for instance um, if someone said to me oh well, let's come and do a television series in China in Peking I mean I'd like I'd go because I've never been there before I'd like to see what, what it's like had a curiosity and the fact that uh, if they said to me of course they can't speak English you have to do it all in mime without any words I would say yes okay well, I'll have a go without really you know thinking out all the uh, <laughs> without thinking out all the difficulties and I go there and, and I think well I enjoy it made it it was enjoyable I, it was a change I, something I haven't done before you see and that's the thing I think so wherefore when when um, you ask me, um, I don't know, I, all I hope is that something will come along, A, I, you know, to give me something to do, and B, it'll be interesting, and uh, that's what I like. I like, I haven't been here before, and that's why I'm, I'm enjoying being in Standout, because I've never been played here before. Um, so that's something new. It was just at the start we said about failed rather, but you yeah. really had the last laugh because you have appeared in quite a few straight roles over the years, haven't you? Yeah, well, you mean straight? Well, you well, mean plays? Um, um, yeah, but I played comedy parts. Yeah. Yeah. See, I've never had this idea that I could play Hamlet or anything that's yeah. stupid like that. I've always been very happy to be a comic, 
and try and a clown. I mean, and if I can make a few people have a, a laugh, I'm very happy and grateful. So I'm privileged. So I mean, I'm, I don't know delusions about being a, a Hamlet complex. Not at all. No, no. There, um, you've got, you've got uh, Richard Burton, Lawrence Olivier, and Gil, John Gilbert for all that sort of thing. And I'm, you know, we, I do what I do, and I do my, well, you know, I do my best. And sometimes I'm, I'm successful, and sometimes I'm not successful. I mean, it's all really in the lap of the gods in a way because um, you come across all sorts of conditions and all sorts of different uh, places and uh, you never know it's like you never know what's going to happen so it's like playing in finals at Wimbledon you just hope that you'll if you're the you'll win yeah. <laughs> Frankie Howard thanks very much for talking. oh thank you thank you very much it's great He's got a swell personality, he meets and greets the stars with such amenity, good enough to make you coming out of the street, John Hanna That's right. Happy memories there, an interview I did backstage at Sandown Pavilion with Frankie Howard in 1980. A week or two after the interview was published in the local paper, I had a message from Frankie Howard. Would my wife and myself like to go out to dinner late one night after a show with Frankie, his manager and his pianist? So we went to the show when we met up with Frankie and the rest of his party and we went to a place called the Culver Haven at Bembridge on the Isle of Wight overlooking the sea. A marvellous night. It was all very quiet to start with and I thought, how can I get him going? It was just after one of those Borg and McEnroe epic tennis finals at Wimbledon. I knew Frank liked tennis, so I mentioned it. With that, he never stopped talking for the rest of the evening. During our conversation at dinner, he suddenly said, John, do you ever think of dying? And then he asked my wife what I was like indoors, this and that. It was a wonderful evening. As we came out, about 1.30, he put his hand on my shoulder and said, John, do you know anything about stars? And I said, well, I've just interviewed one. And he said, no, look up. And there was I being told by Frankie Howard of all the star constellations. I didn't know anything about astronomy. Frankie Howard obviously did because... I learnt quite a lot that night. If you're interested in reading about Frankie Howard, he's in my latest book called The John Hannam Showbiz Interviews, which features the stories behind lots of my showbiz interviews over my 44-year career. There's nearly 100 stars in this one, and Frankie Howard is certainly one of them. Just go to my website, johnhannam.com, and you can find how you can buy it online. Keep looking on the Isle of Wight Radio website, the John Hannam website and YouTube for more John Hannam Meets new interviews. Bye-bye for now. Isle of Wight Radio.